My guest today is Hao Lu. Hao, how are you? Hey, good. Um, what's, uh, tell me what you do. What do you do? I'm a senior software engineer. Uh, uh, me too. <laughs> at Microsoft. Uh-huh. Uh, we used to be on the same team. I remember that. That was great. <laughs> We're sort of on like sister teams now. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. What's your job uh, mostly? So I'm part of the commercial software engineering um, or org at Microsoft. And our job is to solve some of Microsoft's uh, customers' hardest technical problems. Okay. Um, and then you also are, uh, in order to, to meet that goal, you're out just exploring new technologies and boldly going where no yep. software engineer has gone before. <laughs> uh, you're, yeah. um, and you were telling me about a new language, or at least new to you. I don't know if it's a new overall. Tell, it is. Tell me. Uh, yeah, so I was telling you about this language that I've been looking into called Rust. R-U-S-T, and Rust. Not Rust. Yes, not Rust, mm-hmm. Rust. Okay. And it is a relatively new language. Right. I think it came out maybe three years ago, four okay. years ago. That's new to me as well. Yeah, um, and it's a really fascinating language to me. Um, what drew you to this language? So, first of all, it's a language that's meant to replace C and C++. So we recognize oh, Good luck with that. <laughs> it recognizes a lot of the headaches that C, C++ developers experience, mm-hmm. like managing your, your pointers, yeah. like managing memory, um, and actually, so the language is created by Mozilla, mm-hmm. and Firefox, the newest version of Firefox, is built on top of Rust. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've already got one popular, successful application yes. of this to demonstrate that it can be used by millions of people around the world. Right. And it's a language that's definitely built with its developers in mind. Okay. So um, when you download the language, you Wait, can... as opposed to who? What, what languages are not built with developers in mind? Well, I think some languages are built with the system in mind, right? Like C, C++, okay. I would say it, they're languages that were built essentially from the ground up, knowing like what the system needs rather okay. than what the developers need. Oh, that's an interesting concept. Okay. Right. So like as a developer, we need things like version control. We need things like ma- manage or uh, package management, things like that. OK. Um, and that's easier in Rust than in C? Absolutely. I mean, there is really isn't a standard package management for C or C++. Hmm. Um, but there is one built in, like right in, in Rust. Oh, I see. Is this in the, sort of in the concept that uh, NPM is sort of built into Absolutely. Node and uh, NuGet is sort of built into that. Node. Ah, yes. Yeah. So actually, Node NPM is wasn't built into Node. Okay. Right. NPM came after Node. Okay. But with Rust, it was all thought before the initial release of the language. Oh, interesting. All right. So those hooks are stronger. Yeah, it's it's very very intentional. Like. Mm-hmm. You can tell just by the design of the language that it's very intentionally created. Hmm. Is it? Um, would you describe it as an object-oriented language or a functional language, or is it, does it fall into one of those nice categories like it's, that? It's it's statically typed. Uh-huh. So um, so which means that as you're writing, you have to type like what your variables mean, mm-hmm. and then because of that, and because just the way that the language is designed it encourages more of the functional way of, of creating your, your project. Okay. Um, and there isn't a construct of class in mm. Rust. Um, it's more of um, a trait in Rust. Okay. So trait I would sounds say, like property to me. Yeah, so it's it's not like a property. And again, I'm just learning Rust. Okay, so fair enough. So some of the you things you're farther ahead than I am. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's an object oriented the language. Okay, all right. Uh, what sort of things do you envision? Uh, you know, other than you're probably not going to build your own browser. What what, what <laughs> things do you think you and other people are going to be using? This yeah. Way? So one of the things that really fascinates me with Rust is that you can actually import a Rust file in your JavaScript. Oh, it's will, it's, it, will it run inside a browser? Yes, it uh, will run in the browser. Hmm. Um, and that's done through WebAssembly. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. So, so if your browser supports WebAssembly, which most modern browsers do, that's right. Then uh, is it is it does it compile down to, to WebAssembly Web or transpile down to that? I'm not sure what the yes. right word is here. Yes. So if you use this bundler okay. called Parcel, Mm-hmm. which is just a bundler that you would use um, 
for creating your JavaScript um, mm -hmm. project, you can actually just straight up do um, import and then the function from a Rust file. Okay. And Parcel, this bundler, will actually recognize, oh, you have a .rs file, which is the Rust file. Okay. It will run the uh, WebAssembly um, compiler and it will compile it and automatically use the function that you have exported from the Rust file into your JavaScript. Okay, and you said earlier that it was sort of uh, comparable to C or C++. Mm -hmm. Does that mean it's, it's built for more low-level stuff? Is that, uh, is that why you would import it into a, a JavaScript yeah. application? Because JavaScript is, is great for browsers and logical flow, but it's not good at accessing the hard drive or just anything low-level. Right, so to me, currently, just my understanding of Rust, um, the reason why you would import a Rust file into your JavaScript is for performance reasons. Okay. So let's say that you are doing some sort of like matrix modification. Sure, something or, inside of a tight loop you have to do a million times. Exactly. Um, you can do that a lot faster in Rust than you can in like your JavaScript. Oh, so even if you're not doing something low level, let me talk it to the hardware, for example. Yeah. Uh, it's still the performance would be a good reason why. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Um, Right. Yeah. So well, let me ask you, why, why are you learning? Is this because you're a JavaScript guy and you want to go it faster or is it is it an academic exercise or? It's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, actually, when I first started looking into Rust, it wasn't because I could use it in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. It was just something that I, I wanted to look into. Okay. Um, because as I program, I, I recognize there are things that are headaches, right? Like mutability. Mm -hmm. um, when you mutate something, it's actually it's really hard for you to keep track of what happens to that object. Um, it's hard and, for the compiler to do that, to track that as well. Right. So, but then with, with Rust, it's actually hard for, well, it's meant to be hard to uh, mutate your object. Okay, everything so, is set to be immutable. Okay, so it's not like some of these hardcore functional language where everything is immutable. It yeah. Just, it just, the easier path is to make everything immutable. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, where where did you get started? Where people learn about this? Yeah, so you can. There's this Rust documentation called the book. You just have to search Rust language the book. Okay, we'll find um, a link for that. Yeah, and it's a official documentation for Rust mm -hmm. that you can learn just all the concepts. Um, and I listen to podcasts a lot. Um, oh, give me some references <laughs> for some some uh, recommendations for good so uh, the Rust. Uh, podcast that I listen to is called New Crustacean. Okay. Uh, New Rustation. New Rustation. All right. Yeah. <laughs> like, a, um, like a white sport coat and a pink crustacean. <laughs> no, I, well, it's <laughs> like, so the logo for Rust is a crab, uh, like okay. a red crab. Right. So it's the, like a crustacean. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, I really like the language so far. Um, besides the mutability and immutability yes. uh, features, yes. there's this thing called ownership for Rust. So in our current sort of language landscape, there is either garbage collecting, right, where the system kind of does everything for you, or it's CC or C++ where you have to manage your memory. Right. Right. Um, but with Rust, it's somewhere in between. Like you mm -hmm. are not the person managing memory, mm -hmm. um, you but you are specifying what part of your language owns the variable. Okay, so, so it's more deterministic than .NET, for example. Yeah, but you don't have to write all that code to clean up. Exactly. Like in C++. Exactly. Okay. So Rust will actually detect once the variable inside of a particular slow, a scope that owns your variable okay. is out of scope, it automatically clears that memory. I immediately? Yes, okay. immediately. Okay. Um, so I, I understand they tried that in .NET, the early days of .NET, and they uh -huh. took the feature out because it would it would run at the wrong time. You know, uh, they, they decided it's better to optimize it and say, all right, when the computer's not doing anything. Uh, interesting. I mean, I, this is something I've read third hand. I could be wrong, but... So I think... The way that Rust solves that um, is this thing called lifetime. Mm -hmm. So you can specify what the lifetime of a particular variable uh, inside of a function is. So if okay. you're, you're you're passing multiple parameters into okay. your function, you can specify the lifetime of each. Okay, of you say parameter. lifetime, and I think scope. Yeah, I mean it's similar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else? Well, tell me something else cool about Rust. 
Um, okay, so... Wait, if, let me ask you this. Is, is it uh-huh. open source? It is. So it it's, is. It's totally free. It's totally free. And there's is there a paid version? Or what does Mozilla nope. get out of this? I think they just want to give back to the community. Okay. I don't know All what right. they get out of it. Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like, why do we have TypeScript? What does Microsoft get out of that? Good question. <laughs> That's a subject for another show. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of nice features for Rust. Um, mutability, um, the ownership. Um, oh, man, I'm, I'm spacing on some of the other ones. Um, but as a language, as I mentioned, you get a really nice... Um, error messages. Mm. So in the console, you can see exactly where your code is is erring out mm. um, with pointer to like the actual um, like character. You're talking space. about the console if you run it inside of a browser, even uh, that. But oh no, not not in the browser. Now what's your in, development environment? So just like in your terminal, like mm. when you're running a Rust program. Oh, okay. Yeah. So mm-hmm. at a command prompt or a, mm-hmm. a Linux terminal command. Right. Um, are you, uh, what, what, so what do you, well, do you have a development environment for this? What's, what do you write your code in? Uh, you can use VS Code. Oh, is yeah. there, there's a plugin for it? There is a plugin for it okay. that has all the syntax highlighting and all the errors. Um, so you see the squiggly if anything goes wrong. Oh, okay. And I think if I remember, you are a uh, Java and a PHP and a .NET developer. Those are the three languages that you're historically uh, a lot of. Is that correct? A- everything except the .NET. I'm not, not, not a .NET. Most, mostly a... JavaScript. JavaScript, PHP. PHP. Is this comparable to those languages? Like uh, I'm asking because I want to know mm-hmm. what the learning curve is given that skill set. Uh, it is really not similar to those languages okay. at all. all right. um, you sort of have to go in without any preconceived notion of what a language should be oh, okay. because of the ownership uh, concept. Because hmm. I think that is very novel compared to... So that, is that other. the biggest learning curve that you have is, is getting your yes. head around the ownership idea? Yes. I think the ownership is probably the hardest concept to kind of grok. Um, because the syntax might look a little bit weird um, hmm. when you first go into it. And that's what controls the, the, the lifetime and mm-hmm. when these objects are destroyed. Right. And the memory is cleaned up. Right. Okay. This is interesting. Um, what's, um, uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Um, I can't think of anything. Okay. What's yeah. next for you? For me, yeah, you're gonna for go do some ha- hacking and some uh, <laughs> traveling. You were you went around the world last year, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so Kevin and I, Kevin, someone on my team, yeah, um, he's been on the show. Yeah. Uh, um, and we've been building this this bot framework library called Bot Builder Wolf. Wolf. Spell wolf. Just like the animal. A wolf. Okay. Yeah. And the goal of Wolf is to manage the conversation flow for you, oh. um, but in a declarative manner. So before, I'm sure you like built bots before, but mm-hmm. the way that you kind of manage uh, dialogues is, okay, if a user said this, like, then you respond this. If the user said this, you have to respond this. But if you are trying to collect a large number of Large, uh, fields or uh-huh. a large amount of data, uh, you have to write a lot of if, if statements. Yeah. And the hard part is, let's say that because you want to support natural language, mm-hmm. right? Because you're building a bot, theoretically, a person can type whatever they want into your your text input. So a person can say, "Hi, my name is How. I'm 30 years old." And you know, I work at Microsoft. That mm-hmm. three pieces of information right. in one sentence, uh-huh. right? And let's say that you're collecting not just those three things, but maybe five things. So you're missing two of them. Mm-hmm. How would you write that logic right. in your code, like imperatively, right? Like mm-hmm. with if statements, you have to do a lot of checks. Right. Um, so the thing that Kevin and I created is you just have to write this one, essentially almost like JSON, mm-hmm. but you can actually write functions in there. But you, you just define like what information you want to collect from the, the user and what we call slots. So, so in this example, you have five slots. You have the name, you have age, you have the workplace, you might have other interests. And Wolf will be able to say like, oh, actually we picked up three slots out of the five. 
I'll just ask the next missing thing. Hmm. And it will just facilitate dialogue for you. Very nice. Yeah. All declarative. The one declarative framework I saw was, I think it was called Q&A. Have you used that one? Yeah. Right at the top so, of the framework. Right. So Q&A is more just... It doesn't just, do what you described. Exactly. It just saves you from writing all those if statements. Exactly. Yeah. So that one, it handles questions and then it'll respond back with an answer. Yeah. Um, but this is more more specific. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. How thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, David. Creating interesting technology is coding with your friends. <laughs>